Hello. Our story begins inside the barracks of a Venator-class Star Destroyer. The vessel was orbiting Kuat. The Republic had secured an axis in the previous week, alongside that of another successful skirmish. The 501st was crushing things during the war. They had returned to Kuat so that they could resupply and prepare for the next leg of the war. The General is hopeful to get a rotation or two back on Coruscant, but it just wasn't in his cards. Sadly, Anakin would likely have to wait until the Outer Rim sieges were finished before he could go home and see his wife. The rest of the men were pretty indifferent to this. They were soldiers after all. Sure, it sucked not having Ahsoka around anymore because she was like a big sister, but it had been at least months since she was last here. In one of the cots in the barracks, a clone trooper shot up. His brow was sweating and he wiped the back of his hand against it. Kix looked over at his squad mates to see if they were doing anything, which they weren't. Everyone was sleeping and the room was still. Kix felt his chest and he could feel his heart rate shooting through the ceiling. This was yet another nightmare for him. It was about what Rex and some of the course and guardsmen said in regards to Fives' death. It just didn't sit well on his mind or the heart. Commander Fox killed one of his brothers when it was clear that said brother was sick. As a squad medic, it was Kix's job to take care of his brothers and make sure no harm ever came to them. It was him who sent Rex and Anakin to Fives' location, so in a way, he felt responsible for the entire thing that happened, which couldn't be further from the truth. Kix took a deep breath. His heart rate slowed down as he came back from the dream. In the dream, he was running in the battle, and just as Tup did, Captain Rex shot Anakin in the back. Following that betrayal, Rex was killed and the other clones acted similar to how Tup did, without control over their own bodies. Kix tried to stop them, but he couldn't, before they turned on him. Locking him up and telling him that he was standing against their orders, they all in one united voice told Kix that good soldiers follow orders. It wasn't just bred into them, but basic Kaminoan conditioning. As soldiers, they were told to follow orders, and the mantra that Tup spoke of was one that was used to control the troopers of the clone army. Kix rubbed his eyes as he swung his legs over the bed and got up, stretching ever so slightly. His bones cracked and his muscles tightened. He could feel himself getting older every week, and the thought of being in his 40s in the next couple years frightened him. He still should technically be a child, but instead, he was an adult, watching his brothers die nearly every day. Similar to the battle reports he read, it was a horrid life. Kix walked out of the room thinking quietly to himself, calling out Tup and Fives by name to himself. He exited the barracks silently. Luckily, the Venator was in sleep mode. The hallways were dimmed a little bit, so it wasn't blinding when he left the barracks. He went to the mess hall and grabbed something to snack on, as he skimmed through his hollow pad. At the moment, he was simply looking at battle reports, but it very quickly became too depressing to continue. So he put it away and started looking back into the Fives case. Kix didn't like the idea of just letting it go, but there really wasn't anything to investigate in his mind. The Jedi were informed by the Chancellor and lead scientist Nala Se that there was a virus on Ringo Vinda. It infected the two clones and they were all given an inoculation to prevent it. The only thing is, despite the clones being genetic copies of one another, typically, whenever these inoculations went out, there would be one or two cases of a clone getting sick or having some inverse effects. It wasn't super common, but it did happen every time the Grand Army needed extra chemical protection from the elements. So why didn't this happen with this particular inoculation? The only reason Kix was so confused and concerned about it was because the scientist, the one who at least according to Shakti's report had been working on Fives and Tup the entire time, came up with the inoculation. So if Nalase was working on two clones and then bringing one of said clones to Coruscant, how could she develop a cure so quickly? Maybe she was taking credit for someone else's work, but it still seemed unlikely, especially when no one had any effects from whatever they were given. Kix rubbed his eyes. It was the middle of the night, and he was exhausted. He hoped that the snack would put him back to sleep, and it was making him tired, so he leaned towards going back to bed. But he knew himself. He was too awake now, especially because he found something with such an interesting case. The clones weren't exactly trusting of Nala Se and her scientific department. They experimented on unwitting clones, and they were very secretive. Kix decided that he would quietly launch an investigation of his own into this. As squad medic, it was his duty to make sure he took care of his brothers. His little project initially started with him going directly to the med bay, pulling up reports on Fives' biopsy, and similar to that, the biopsy of Clone Trooper Top. The first and most clear thing about both clones was their scars. 
they had matching incisions on the top side of their head, which indicated to Kix that these were cuts used to take out the inhibitor chips, which were also shown on the biopsy as removed. The big thing that Nalase seemed to think, or at least care about in regard to this case, was the inhibitor chips and the need for an inoculation. Something about this entire situation felt odd to Kix. According to Nalase, these chips were used to keep the clones in check, but that didn't sound right. If it was meant to keep the clones in check, then why have the basic training, conditioning, and so forth if the Kaminoans, Jedi, or whoever else wanted these chips implanted could just control the clones all at once? That thought made Kix realize something. These inhibitor chips might indeed have a deeper and darker secret behind them. Kix's hypothesis was accidentally correct. He just didn't have the evidence to prove it to anyone. As he prepared to go back to Kamino, he realized he should have an ally, but he didn't know who to bring. Kix wanted someone along for the ride, just in case something happened to him, but who? As he ran through his mind trying to find the right trooper to aid him, he came to Rex, but he couldn't bug the clone captain. Rex was a good man and a good leader, but he couldn't just abandon his post on Kuat for some random mission that wasn't even a mission. Truthfully, the thought of going undercover made Kix realize that he might die in service of his brothers. But that's what clones were supposed to do. If he didn't do it, then he might as well be a battle droid. An uncaring killing machine, whose only intent and fixation was on victory and nothing else. Kix, aside from his hypothesis, didn't want anyone else to get hurt from these inhibitor chips. In his mind, at least going off of his basic hypothesis, if the Separatists found a way to corrupt these chips, then the entire Grand Army could crumble into madness, like Top, or even worse. If the inhibitor chips had controlling attributes, like those listed in Nalise's report, then it could be even worse in the wrong hands. The only issue is, Kix had already gone too far. Opening up Nalise's files and even Shakti's report were very big problems. He wasn't supposed to access them. He did it with a bug he found when he was a young trooper. One day as a cadet, he was messing around and accidentally snatched a keychain from Nalise. As a clone, he liked to memorize things, so he didn't. In the present, he still had his memories from that. Shakti's report wasn't as private, but it was still semi-private. Kix just used Captain Rex's codes to access it, because the Jedi General likely wouldn't care, simply due to Rex being involved. As Kix prepared to request a leave of absence so he could go to Kamino, Nalase was informing Count Dooku of everything she had uncovered in her morning ritual. A clone trooper was attempting to locate information about the inhibitor chips. Lord Tyrannus told her that he would ensure he was captured and dealt with properly. There was no reason to risk the exposure of Order 66. Kix would do as he had before, receiving his leave of post, going to Kamino, finding and securing the information, and then finally preparing to leave. However, while he was on Kamino, he realized that there were others watching him. He feared for his life and that of all of his brothers. Kix learned that his hypothesis was mostly correct. Someone could control the clone army and make them follow random orders without their consent. Which as soldiers didn't seem like that big of a deal, but it was a total mind control, something they couldn't stop. Something that would completely revoke any sense of sentience that the clone army had and force them to follow orders that they didn't know or want to follow. Kix wasn't comfortable with this in the slightest, and he worried for what might come if he didn't tell the Jedi. With the Kaminoans seemingly watching him, he didn't want to be snatched up, so in an effort to make sure he wasn't tracked or intercepted, he used an astromech, gave it orders, and told the droid to relocate to the fleet over Kuwa. The R2 unit did as it was asked, going into a Republic shuttle with Kix's departure time and leaving. Shortly following the astromech's departure, Kix left the hangar bay without a sanctioned leave time. As he abandoned Kamino, he never saw the astromech shuttle. It was like it vanished from the face of the galaxy. By the way he timed things up, he should have seen it jump to hyperspace, but there was no sign of the vessel. Regardless, Kix knew that he was being tracked at this point, so he readily prepared everything he could to make sure he never lost the information he had. In a very, very long hollow recording, he jotted down all the information he retrieved from Topoka City while also showing proof on the hologram itself. If he was apprehended upon his arrival to Kuat, he would at least be able to get this information into the right hands. Kix's speech lasted almost the entire duration of the trip from Kamino to Kuat. When he arrived, there was a fighter escort that guided him in the General Skywalker's flagship. This only indicated that what he feared was true. The Separatists must have informed a Kaminoan that a clone escaped their custody. Because Nalase knew it was Kix, she informed the fleet of Akuwat of his betrayal, and that, similar to Top, 
he needed to be apprehended before he did some serious damage to the Republic military by harming and or killing Anakin Skywalker. When Kix walked out of the ship, he saw an armed unit awaiting him, and in front was Anakin with his arms crossed. He told Kix that they heard about what he did on Kamino. The clone medic raised his hands slowly and told them that he wasn't armed, and he wasn't dangerous. He didn't know what Nalase had told them, but he had important information about Fives and the tough investigation. Anakin looked to Rex, who stepped forward, removing his helmet and asking what he found. Skywalker tried to interject, but Kix started before he could say anything. Kix told his commanding officer that the Kaminoans had an ability, one to control the entire Grand Army of the Republic with a couple of words. Tup's incident was isolated, but he asked them why the Separatists were so interested in capturing Tup. Remember the light corvette they had to send to Kamino because the shuttle was destroyed and Tup was captured? The plot went deeper and thicker, as he told them that Fives learned the truth before his death, and he would have uncovered it too if he hadn't been killed. Kix looked back to Anakin and told him he wanted an audience with the Jedi Council. Anakin was in disbelief. How or why exactly did the High Council need to be involved? Kix believed that Count Dooku or someone else was involved in this plot. He wasn't sure, but he reminded them that Fives was afraid of something. Kix almost slipped up. He knew that Anakin and the Chancellor were extremely close, so if he said that Fives was afraid of the Chancellor, then he may have lost his ability to speak with the Jedi. Anakin agreed because of that. This was important information, and it was too important to lose. He told Rex to take himself and 20 of their best men to the Arquentan's Redeemer and then return to Coruscant immediately. Rex was surprised, but Anakin believed that if this plot was going as deep as Kix suggested, then they needed to open up this investigation and get to the bottom of it. He waved his hands, telling them to move out quickly. If the Kaminoans were in on the joke, or if they believed there was something that would hurt them, then there might be a Separatist fleet on the way to Kuat at this moment. Anakin wasn't entirely on board with it, but it wasn't like Fives' case. Kix was calm and collected. Nalase tried to paint him in the same light that she did with Fives, but he wasn't acting erratic. The only thing is, she couldn't drug Kix, so he didn't act out. He acted as he normally did, and he communicated with very little issue. In the span of 25 minutes, Kix was off to the light cruiser and they departed for Coruscant. Shortly after they left, a massive Separatist fleet led by General Grievous dropped out of hyperspace. It was a risky operation, but Dooku needed to make sure they got Kix back into their control. As the clones were en route to Coruscant, Anakin informed them that his hypothesis was correct. They needed to be discreet upon their arrival to Coruscant and the Jedi Temple. The Separatists were onto them. This only confirmed that Kix was right, and the fact that whatever Fives and Tup uncovered almost exposed the entire Separatist war plan. Something that none of the clones were aware of was what Anakin knew. In a council session a couple months earlier, a bit before the Siege of Anaxus, there was a council session. Anakin and Obi-Wan had a short mission to Obadia, where they located the Chancellor's aide Silman. During Chancellor Valorum's reign, Silman and sifo were sent to Obadia to work out some kind of deal, eventually resulting in the Jedi Master being killed. As they understood, after a short conversation with Dooku, it was the Sith who created the clone army. sifo did go to Kamino and the Kiminoans were familiar with him, but Lord Tyrannus chose Jango Fett. He was the one responsible for so much more than what sifo was aware of before his death. This resulted in the Council deciding to withhold information from Palpatine until the war was over with, something Anakin was in total disagreement with. When the clones arrived, the Jedi escorted the clones quickly into the temple, thanks to a warning made by Skywalker. The Jedi brought Kix down into the lower levels of the temple instead of the Council chambers. They all asked what it was that he discovered, and he revealed every bone-chilling detail. He told them that there was a plot on Kamino to use the clone army for bad, and the fact that Clone Trooper Fives was right. This was where he exposed a little tidbit about the Chancellor, not outright saying that there was anything confirming that Palpatine was involved, but believing that Fives, in his right mind, feared the Chancellor for some reason. The Council murmured to themselves as they tried to piece together how they should go about this. The evidence was irrefutable. In the Dooku circumstance, they could turn a blind eye because they were winning the war, and there was no reason to believe that Dooku would turn their army against them. But this showed them that there was no safety. This was the eye-opening moment the Jedi Council needed, and with more of their council members spread out than ever before, it became extremely apparent that there was something coming. The dark side was growing, and their ability to sense what was around them was continuously shrinking. The Sith were moving in, and it was time they stopped acting like they were in full control of everything. The Jedi thanked Kix and told him and his squad to remain inside the Jedi Temple. 
they would like to see if they could get access to the inhibitor chips. Kix volunteered though. He didn't want something in his mind controlling him. The Jedi were kind of in a bind. While Kix and the other troopers who had escorted him here were having their inhibitor chips removed, they were discussing their next move. It was clear they needed to go to Kamino. The only question was, were things too late? There was still no report back from Skywalker, so he might still be in battle with General Grievous. Truthfully speaking, Palpatine likely already knew the Jedi were learning of these inhibitor chips. Master Windu suggested that they call every Jedi and tell them to return home, or if they were too far away, to return to some of the abandoned outposts in the galaxy. That wasn't a terrible idea. Yoda nodded his head, motioning for Kiari Mundi to go to the archives and send out the distress signal to Jedi across the stars. This would actively remove every Jedi from the battlefront. The next question became how to approach the possibility of Palpatine being behind this. There was an idea though. Maybe if they took over Kamino, they could secure themselves control over the inhibitor chips. Through all the information Kix collected, there was nothing to suggest that they couldn't control all the chips from Kamino. It would be similar to a droid control ship in that circumstance, the ones from the Battle of Naboo. So it wasn't super far-fetched that everything had to be controlled from Kamino. Agon Kohler asked if it was really worth trying to secure the planet. Even if they did, wouldn't they still be able to issue out orders elsewhere? This was true. It wasn't like they could remove every inhibitor chip from the clone army. So how could they legitimately counter this? They were stuck. The council had to face their greatest failure head on. Telling Palpatine that the clone army was created by Dooku wouldn't change anything. But if they showed some readiness or maybe even reaction to the news a couple months back, then maybe they wouldn't be stuck here. Yoda didn't want to abandon Coruscant, but it needed to be done. He took a bundle of temple guards and discreetly left the planet. He didn't know what he would accomplish, but with Shakti on Kamino, it would be worthwhile to use her knowledge of Topoka City to make a move that would shut down the entire planet. They needed to seize control over these weapons. At the same time, orders were sent out galaxy-wide by Kiara Mundi to send each of the respective Jedi generals, commanders, and so forth to locations around the galaxy or back home. The temple was to subtly raise the defenses. Without definitive proof that Palpatine was behind anything, the Jedi also couldn't make a move against him. This was a very delicate procedure, and they had to be quick and quiet with it. Palpatine, on the other hand, was working magic on his own. Dooku alerted him to the change of plans, and the fact that General Grievous was currently engaging with Skywalker's fleet to retrieve the plans. This was either really stupid or really smart of Dooku to do. He knew that Palpatine didn't want Grievous and Skywalker in the same area, but now they were fighting for the destiny of the galaxy. They still believed that Kix had the plans with Skywalker's fleet. Palpatine was willing to forgive it, because if he lost Kix to the Republic and the Jedi, then everything could fall apart in his hands. While he wouldn't be connected to the plans, the Senate might flip the clone army on his head and remove their inhibitor chips or possibly worse. Without the title of Emperor Palpatine, he couldn't manipulate everything the way he wanted, not yet at least. He then, from a galaxy away, force choked Dooku and told him to go to Kuat himself and collect the clone trooper. If he didn't do that, then it was his head. These type of failures could not be allowed to continue. The Sith were to return and it wouldn't be on Dooku's fallacies that they would crumble. But there was a change in the force. Something was going to happen, and he feared that it would be Skywalker losing the General Grievous over Kuat. But that wasn't exactly the case at the moment. General Grievous was closing in on Skywalker's flagship, but Anakin was flying in a starfighter, so it wasn't like he was inside the capital ship to begin with. Inside the Jedi Temple, the clones had their inhibitor chips removed, and they were able to express their differences in their feelings, which weren't very drastic. Not at all like the reports from Fives' behavior, which only went to prove that Nalise went out of her way to make the clone trooper uncomfortable and even paranoid. This only solidified that Kix was onto something, and without his diligence, the Jedi might be in big trouble. However, Mace was antsy, but they couldn't make a move. It felt like they were sitting ducks, and while they had been for the entire war, the fact that they were now completely aware of it made this the greatest fear in the galaxy for the Jedi. They were meant to be strong of mind, but when they knew their enemies can control a galaxy-wide army, it made their odds feel insurmountable. The Siege of Kuat continued to get larger and larger. At first, it was two of the largest fleets colliding in a clash of skill and brilliance and military strength, but very quickly, defense fleets from around the core came to support Anakin, not to mention the fact that General Grievous was getting more reinforcements thanks to Dooku's pursuit of clone trooper kicks. Due to these extra reinforcements from each side, 
General Skywalker, as the only present Jedi at the planet, was kind of taking command of the largest battle during the war. He was winning the fighter fight, but he needed to return to the bridge so he could regather his thoughts and understand the changes to the battle map. Admiral Yularen wasn't struggling, but he wanted Skywalker to understand that he was in command of a larger fleet than he initially started out with. Anakin sped his fighter back into the hangar bay and rushed to the bridge so he could see the complete and total change on the battle map. Instead of his fighter, he was solely focused on the fight at hand, but now he was really able to see how large the battle was. With more fleets coming in to assist, Yularen was delegating command to new captains and admirals within the fleet. Anakin looked down and noted that General Grievous was attempting to bronze at the flagship. According to his battle tactics, that meant that he would attempt to board. Yularen told Anakin that he saw this coming, which is also why he wanted Anakin here in the first place. But also, the truth is, if they allowed General Grievous to board, they could gain some more strength in their shields. It would then become a contest of generals instead of battle cruiser to battle cruiser, which was something Yularen believed they might lose with General Grievous' flagship. Anakin nodded his head and ran forward, calling out to Sergeant Oppo and newly appointed Arc Trooper Jesse to follow him. As the battle started to begin inside of Anakin's flagship, Count Dooku's fleet arrived to assist the Siege of Kuat. Outside of Kamino, a group of Jedi arrived from hyperspace. They moved down to the surface where shocked he was patiently waiting. The Jedi marched out, following their Grand Master. The Temple Guards were awaiting their orders as Shakti explained everything Yoda needed to know. He delegated a couple members of the squad to intercept a Prime Minister and lock him down in his office, whereas Shakti and Yoda would find Alice and force her to reveal their answers. The arrival of the Temple Guard went unnoticed, as they did as they came here to do. Nalase was confused as she and Omega were blitzed by the Jedi inside of her scientific chambers. She acted like she didn't know what they meant, but Shakti and Yoda used a dual mind trick to coax information from Nalase, all of which being horrid and terrifying. It only led to confusion of how the Jedi should approach this scenario. While there was everything said by Kix, there was the extra information about Dooku and his plans. There is no mention of Dooku's master, simply the fact that it was Dooku who wanted the clones to have the inhibitor chips. But the Jedi also did learn that the Kaminoans didn't have to be the ones to control the clone army. Anyone could. This left the Jedi with a sick predicament. They might want to secure the Senate building and capture Palpatine quietly. If he was the Sith Lord, then he could technically turn the clone army against the Jedi or the Senate or whatever right now. With the Battle of Kuat raging on and Grievous present and Dooku unaccounted for, maybe it wouldn't be a terrible decision to move a select unit of elite Jedi on the Senate. Of course the Senate was aware of the battle, but the Jedi pullback wasn't known and the takeover Kamino wasn't either. Mace gathered together all the present council members and they put it to a vote, with former council members Jocasta Nu and Terra Sanube adding to the vote to replace a couple of the missing faces. It was decided that they would make a move on the Chancellor, though it would be discreet. The Jedi would capture him, bring him back to the temple, and then there would be another group that went into the Senate itself as a distraction, one to inform the Senate that they uncovered a plot, essentially a way to make it seem like Palpatine's disappearance was him running away from something he did. If he was who they suspected him to be, then there wouldn't be any issues with it. When it came to a scenario where Palpatine wasn't a Sith Lord, that would take some explaining, but all would be alright. Mace divided up the squad and sent them separately to the Senate and Executive Buildings. Mace and a couple Jedi from the Council quietly used some old passageways to the Executive Building. They were older than the fall of Coruscant about 3,000 years before. They were put in place so that individuals may traverse between buildings during the Galactic Civil War. It was how the quote-unquote elite could be protected. Obviously, it would be dangerous to move along these corridors, but they needed to do it. As they were moving to secure the Chancellor, Skywalker was engaging General Grievous. The battle was already strenuous because he didn't have Rex by his side, and Appa wasn't as communicative as Rex, so it was just hard to adjust on the spot. Anakin was struggling with Grievous, but it did allow the Republic to pour reinforcements into the battlefield. Anakin's blades clashed with Grievous's as he fell back. The clones were keeping the droids at bay as the school transpired. Anakin could also sense a change in the force. Despite the battle being nothing more than a grudge match with no one gaining ground, there was something coming. He could feel it, but he couldn't focus on it, because his focus was on Grievous. The droid general shoved Anakin back into a crate as he fell over. He blocked a strike before using the force to lob an explosive canister into Grievous' face. The droid threw his hands in front of his face as he blocked it and it exploded in front of him, but he also fell off balance. Anakin got to his feet as super battle droids started to overwhelm the position. 
Skywalker and the clones moved into the corridors as they blew up some explosive canisters and destroyed dozens of battle droids in the process. Anakin regrouped his clones and prepared for a counter assault, when Yularen reported that Dooku entered Grievous' flagship. Chances are they were here for kicks. Anakin smiled, telling Yularen to quietly evacuate the vessel. He would lead them away, but they needed to prime the ship for self-destruction. He then sent R2 to the bridge to configure the protocol without alarms. Yularen was also to use a side hangar on the port side and get everyone out. Anakin, Apo, Jesse, and a bundle of other troopers would hold them off. Anakin told them to funnel every droid into this corridor. The general turned back with a grin, telling the clones that they were going to win this war right here and right now. On Kamino, the scientists and Lama Su were trying to get a hold of the communication devices, but the Jedi, thanks to Shakti, shut down all communication within Taboka City. So it wasn't like anything would be awry unless the clones were trying to do something with other clones, which wasn't a big deal. Shakti displayed everything as an unlisted drill, which wasn't uncommon on Kamino, especially after the battle. The clones followed their orders and protocols and awaited for the drill to end. Shakti was really glad she had this in her arsenal because it would buy the Jedi time to move about. The plan was to get the Kaminoans off-world into a local outpost or back to Coruscant. As the drill was taking place, the Jedi started quietly moving the Kaminoans to a Republic Corvette waiting for them. On Coruscant, Palpatine was walking into his personal chambers inside of his office so he could contact Dooku. As he did, a wall panel opened up in the central walkway and was dragged in by Windu, completely avoiding any detection from the security systems. So all they would see is Palpatine walk from his office and disappear into thin air. As they were doing this, by sedating Palpatine so he couldn't identify the Jedi, temple guards led by Kiari Mundi took a hold of the Senate and stopped them. They told them that there was a plot unfolding on Kamino. They needed every single senator to lock down their rooms and stay put until everything was finished. They also informed them that this was not a hostile takeover, but a protective measure to make sure everyone survived, to make sure nothing happened to the Republic leadership. At Kuat, the battle was moving into Separatist favor, with Grievous and Dooku moving on Skywalker. The vessel was being evacuated from under their noses, and R2 was rolling around with the clones, who were being pushed back quickly. Dooku moved behind the droids, keeping an eye out for clone medics, and seeing if any of them were the clone trooper referenced from the report made by Nala Se. Grievous wanted to engage Skywalker again, but Anakin kept ducking him. He was working heavily on his defenses, which were aiding him here. Anakin and his group of clones were losing numbers, but Skywalker kept them together. They knew what they were doing. As they retreated, Anakin and R2 sealed the doors. Grievous struck at him, but missed. They were now in the hangar bay. Admiral Yularen was waiting for them inside the last few vessels. Anakin waited by the door as his droids and clones ran to Yularen. Four lightsabers penetrated the blast door, and Anakin grinned, turning around and pulling his arms back. As Grievous cut the door down, Anakin threw his hands forward, sending out a shockwave that launched Grievous from his feet and into the dozens of battle droids following him. Anakin turned back and ran into the last transport as they pulled away, and R2 handed him the trigger, which he pressed immediately. The vessel exploded, tearing into millions of pieces killing both Dooku and Grievous at the same time. They relocated to another vessel and continued the battle. Yularen was also able to inform the Jedi on Coruscant of this victory. Syndralic took the message, which was a little odd to Yularen. The group from Kamina was still being relocated, and their vessel had just jumped into hyperspace. Yoda was unaware of this development, but he was closely watching the Kaminoans he had with him, making sure they didn't do anything to try and turn the clones against the Jedi. Not every Kaminoan was inside the ship, which is why Shakti was still inside Topoka City, rounding up the rest of them and making sure they stayed in one place until the drill was finished. On Coruscant, Mace learned the news of everything all at once. The Kaminoan mission seemed like a success, and with Grievous and Dooku dead, the war could end naturally. However, there were some things that the Jedi planned on doing to Papatine to see if he was the Dark Lord of the Sith. They got him into a medical room and quickly checked him, finding that there was a lightsaber hidden in his sleeve. He must have assumed something was going awry. He just didn't expect the Jedi to act so fast. Even though the Jedi were willing to assume that he was a Sith Lord, they had to double check. A midichlorian count was checked and they also opened his eyelids, showing that he had yellow eyes. The Jedi wife forbade them from killing an unarmed man, and as it was revealed by his M count, he had a higher one than almost everyone inside the Order. So perhaps there was another way to handle this. One of the Jedi Masters suggested Carbonite, but there was a fear that someone in the future could open it up, so they had to come up with another idea. But Papatine started to wake up. 
The Jedi panicked, sedating him once more and then deciding to go with the carbon freezing tactic. It worked like a charm, and the Jedi hid his body down in the back of their storage and at the back of their archives, with the hope that it would never be found again. While victory felt inevitable for the Jedi, they'd have to explain their actions. They may have won the war, but they took over the Senate in a panic. They captured a bundle of Kaminoans, and then they revealed the truth. Initially, this looked like a hostile takeover from the Jedi Order, but they forced the Kaminoans to unveil secrets about the clone army. Once the Jedi acted like they just learned, when in reality they've been sitting on information like this for months, specifically the Duke who created the clone army information. The truth was, the clones were ordered by Sifo Dyas, but created and manipulated by Dooku. Sifo believed a war was coming, and Dooku brought said war to the galaxy. Dooku was manipulated by a longtime ally in the government. The Kaminoans didn't know much more outside of that. Everything else was extremely convoluted to them. But the Jedi were able to expose the secrets of Order 66, and the other executive orders that the Chancellor was apparently aware of. The truth is, the Kaminoans did not know Palpatine was involved in this project. It was just Darth Tyrannus. So the Jedi used Palpatine's absence to frame him as the one responsible for this. They also said that Dooku manipulated sifo Dyas and then murdered him after he was the one who set the order for the Kaminoans to create the clone army. It didn't really work, everything felt kind of forced, and the Senate noticed it. But they didn't really have a political reason to target the Jedi. Their work pulled the war to a stop, but they, having revealed the executive orders, weren't the threat that Palpatine could have been. Even though Palpatine, Dooku, and Grievous were gone, the war eventually found a way to start up again. It followed after a couple months of a ceasefire. The Siege of Mandalore actually reignited the fire of war. The Republic was dragged back into a conflict with the Separatists. Without lead warriors like Grievous, Dooku, and Trench, the CIS came off to a rough start. The Republic was able to garner more support in Palpatine's absence, and it made the war drag out into three more years of combat. While Anakin was given the rank of Master, he eventually took a leave of absence that resulted in him leaving the Order when Luke and Leia were born. He didn't want to be away from them, and serving in a war he didn't care about anymore wasn't what he wanted to do. The clones by the time the war kicked off again no longer had their inhibitor chips, and the conflict became a war of attrition. The clones eventually did come out on top, but it was through Jedi and Clone War tactics that did this. They inspired rebellions within Separatist planets and it eventually led to their downfall. It was a war the Republic was able to win, and for the Jedi, they were able to use the destruction of the Sith to propel them into a victory that would change the galaxy for good. In the years following the Clone Wars, the Republic transformed into a new political system, one that utilized the motives of the Confederacy and the ideals of the Republic. It became a more unified government. This truthfully came from Jedi intervention. After they saw the carnage of the Clone War and the work that Palpatine and the Sith were able to do behind the scenes, they replicated the work. The Jedi dispatched Jedi Masters into political arenas across the Republic and got Jedi disguised as Senators to help change the Republic itself. The brilliance of this maneuver was that they were able to infiltrate the Republic and make it their own government in a way. The only downside was how involved the Republic and Jedi Order became. But the bright side of this was how the galaxy benefited from this unknown unison between the Jedi and the Republic. Skywalker's life away from the Order was fantastic, and despite Padme remaining a senator, Anakin opened up a garage shop. It was a great way for him to keep his mechanic skills in tune, while also have a passion away from being a good parent. He did find a want to rejoin the Order at one point or another, but he was glad he made the decision he did. The Order was doing what it needed to do, and it did so without having Anakin needing to be present. Clone Trooper Kix was awarded with high honors with the Republic for exposing the plot to end the Clone War. He almost died midway through the fifth year, but when the war was done and finished, he, like the rest of his brothers, were free to live out the rest of their lives as free citizens. The Kaminoans, Trade Federation, and other greedy entities were bankrupted into oblivion, as the Republic promised itself to be a better government for the people of the galaxy. And that, my friends, is our story. And special thanks to all of our patrons, Benjamin Wells, Ozpin, Angel Dust, Alexandra Reese, The Beginning and End, Django Fett Clone, Nick5098, INTJ Recluse, 
Ben Ingram, The Big Red Pure Mark, Diamond Constant, Darth Nemesis, Lord Tib, CC2024, Galavi Gaming, Tristan, Mandalore, Sir William1767, Darth Revan, Granity Bane, Laliant, Sky Guy, Penguin, Cullen Rooney, Shark Midori, RJ38, Nick, Michael Erlanger, The Last Jedi, Apollo, Wee Was 670, Anika Shank Runner, CT7567, Toaster Oven, Oz of Oz, Darth Knox, The Eternal Padawan, Joshua Tam, John Nguyen, Sansa Skeleton, Jedi Sloth, Mr. Yeet Gamer, Lord Cali, Galaxy 66, Mamino Studios, Anakin 003, Lord Draken, Forward's Legacy Star Wars, Airbus, Rex the Wolf, The Man Three First Names, Dark Saint 46, Baron Joshua, and Lord Deadwing. For supporting the channel, smash that like button, support my OS, check out my Patreon. Cool things on there. Let's talk about this story. So I went into this with the kind of fun idea of doing the investigative piece with kicks, but also having this three-part kind of final act there where you have the, the Kaminoan invasion, the issue with Palpatine, and then the Battle of Kuat. And I kind of wanted to balance those all out. So you kind of get the action from the Battle of Kuat. You get the, the, the Jedi going undercover on both Kamino and Coruscant. And the Jedi just kind of surprising Palpatine, like blindsiding him completely. Because I really wanted to show how this kicks thing would have uprooted everything, and how Dooku probably would have panicked more so than not, trying to cover it up because this kind of is in his hands more than it is Palpatine's. Whereas Palpatine was able to quickly just do away with it with Fives and Fox, Dooku inversely struggles with it because this is something far out of his control. So, I hope you all enjoyed, I love you all, spread the love, and always remember my friends, may the Force be with you.